Today we got some more actual history about Comanche raids along the western frontier of Texas just before the Civil War. Today's story occurred in January of 1858, just two years before the attack on the home of Mrs. Sherman in Parker County, Texas, and the subsequent attacks in Palo Pinto County in 1860. This story occurred nearby in Aerith, Comanche, and what is now Hamilton counties. We will be reading from this book. Indian Depredations in Texas by J.W. Wilbarker. This book was published all the way back in 1889. This story was actually written by James T. DeShields, but it was included in Wilbarker's book. DeShields was much younger than Wilbarker. He was born in Louisiana in 1861, and his family moved to Bell County, Texas shortly after the Civil War. He graduated from Baylor University and published his first book, Frontier Sketches, in 1883. Then he published another book, Cynthia Ann Parker, in 1886. So DeShields was only in his 20s when he contributed this story to Wilbarger's 1889 book. This story is titled Indian Raids in Aerith and Adjoining Counties. And Comanche County is really at the center of this story because it tells of the first blood of a settler shed by an Indian and also the first blood of an Indian shed by a settler in Comanche County. This story took place in 1858 during the final days of slavery in Texas and some of the victims were slaves who worked on some of the ranches in these counties. During the early part of January 1858, several marauding parties of Indians appeared on the frontier again and began depredating in a very bold and daring manner, one squad of eight coming down through Aerith County and entering Comanche County near Jones Barbie's Ranch on Resley's Creek. A black man belonging to Barbie was out some half a mile from the house unhoppling some horses. The Indians ran upon him, lanced him in several places, and left him for dead. But the sable son of Africa survived. After the Indians left, the black man got up and went to the house minus the horses, and reported to his master Barbie that his horses were gone, and him too almost, and in a half jocular, half serious way said, the engines kill me for a while, and they think I was dead for good, but I wasn't. I played possum on them, and they didn't scalp me. After leaving the black man, the Indians passed on down the valley of Resley's Creek, gathering horses as they went. Only a few ranches were in the valley, and it required considerable time to get up a scout. Barbie was left afoot, and the settlements in the valley at that time were like angel visits, few and far between. Eli Pickett, the Neals, and John Boone were living five miles lower down the valley. Boone had started that morning with his wagon and a black man to go to Waco and near the Twin Mountains, then in Comanche out now in Hamilton County. The Indians came upon Boone and the black man killing both of them, and rifled the wagon taking everything they wanted. After killing Boone and his slave, the Indians turned a northeast course from the mountains and came into the Bosque Valley traveling down the same to Meridian Peak, as it was then called, and which stands 14 miles west from Meridian and one and a half miles south of the present town of Iridell. Peter C. Johnson and his little 10-year-old son, Peter C. Jr., had been to Waco to purchase breadstuffs and other family supplies, and were then returning home. And after passing Meridian Peak, since then called Johnson's Peak some 1,200 yards, the Indians, eight in number, surrounded the wagon, killed Peter C. Sr., and captured little Peter C. Jr. They then rifled the wagon and struck out up the Bosque Valley, passing out the northeast gap in Aerith County and the clear fork of the Brazos, carrying out a large bunch of horses. In the meantime, a scout from Resley's Creek and the Leon Valley, consisting of Eli Pickett, Dave Roberts, George B. Hasty, Jim Neal, F.B. Gentry, and Tom Shockley, had hurriedly taken the trail on Resley's Creek. The next morning after, the wounding of Barbie's slave and the finding of Boone and his slave killed on the trail caused considerable delay, as did also the finding of Peter C. Johnson Sr. next, these two unavoidable delays enabled the Indians to get so far the start that it was impossible for the scout to overtake them. On the clear fork of the Brazos, from some cause unknown, the Indians dropped little Peter Johnson, taking his coat, hat, and socks, leaving him with nothing on but his shirt and pants, 50 or 75 miles from the nearest ranch, in the bleak month of January, with nothing to subsist upon and no means of procuring any, and liable to be destroyed by hungry wolves. 
He had wandered from the trail, and the scout sent in pursuit of him had failed to find him. Little Peter lived five days and nights without a single morsel to eat save grass roots. On the morning of the sixth day, he was found by a company of cowboys that Bill Keith had sent out from his ranch to make a roundup. The little fellow had found the cattle and had remained with them, thinking perchance that he could procure milk from some of the cows, but in this he failed, the cows being too wild, but the cow hunters found him in time to revive and save him. But fortunate it was that they found him when they did. A cold, drizzling norther was blowing at the time, and the poor little fellow would evidently have frozen to death during the night that ensued. When brought to Cora a few days after his being found, says Honorable Frank M. Collier, who gave me these facts, he was the poorest looking object imaginable, a mere skeleton. Mr. Collier says he took the little fellow up in his arms and carried him around over town, and procured a present of one dollar from every man in town. Peter grew to manhood and is now a stout, robust man, and a worthy, good citizen of Comanche County. The attack upon Barbie's slave was the first blood drawn by Indians in Comanche County, and Boone and his slave were the first men killed by Indians in Comanche, but now in Hamilton County. During the spring, summer, and fall of 1858, Indian raids into Erith, Comanche, and Brown counties were as frequent and regular as the full and change of the moon, and to preserve life and save property required constant vigilance and continuous scouting, and with all that could be done, hundreds of men in the counties embraced in these articles lost by Indian raids their entire stock of horses, amounting in many cases to several hundred head. Sometime during the month of August 1858, a squad of Indians approached Eli Pickett's house on Resley's Creek. One Indian ventured up to within three or four hundred yards of the house and took a position on high ground to spy out the situation. Mrs. Pickett was preparing dinner and happened to discover the Indian as he was taking his position. Immediately with gun in hand, Pickett and Dave Roberts started and taking advantage of a ravine that chanced to lead in the right direction, they were enabled to approach within 60 yards of the Indian. And while the Indian was looking at some hoppled horses hard by in the valley, two unerring rifles rang at the same instant. Two balls entered the Indian's breast, killing him instantly. This was the first Indian killed inside the boundary lines of Comanche County. So that's it for this episode from J.W. Wilbarger's 1889 book, Indian Depredations in Texas. These events took place around 1858 through 1860, and there would be frequent raids into these counties all the way until 1875. I am now going to read a short section from the newspaper, The Comanche Chief, that reported a few more details about Peter Johnson. This newspaper is still in print as a weekly, and this is from the September 16, 1882 issue. I also saw little Peter Johnson brought into Stephenville a living skeleton. His father had been murdered at Johnson's Peak, 15 miles west of Meridian. Little Peter was taken prisoner and kept several days, after which he was turned loose in severely cold weather in January. He was picked up by a man named Buff, who was afterwards killed by the Indians in 1868 or 1869, while keeping cattle for Dr. Tuggle out on the Colorado River. Ben Smith of Brown County was killed at the same time. Little Peter Johnson, as I call him, was horrible to look at when he was brought in, but he is a large, healthy man now and lives nine miles east of Comanche. For a particular statement on the horrible butchery he witnessed, you should apply to him. So that part of the story at least had the silver lining of Little Peter surviving, even though his father was killed and he suffered a terrible ordeal of being captured and then out on his own for five days. Peter was actually the youngest of many children. His mother, Matilda Watley Johnson, was born in Georgia in 1810, and she would live until 1885. There is also another account of the first Indian blood drawn in Comanche County, Texas, by Pickett and Roberts in 1858. This is from Joseph Carroll McConnell's 1939 book, West Texas Frontier. In this account, Pickett's first name is given as Alex rather than Eli Pickett. I haven't been able to find much information about these two men outside of these accounts. 
T.M. Shackley and his sister Margaret had been up to the ranch about one and a half miles northeast of Mr. Shockley's home. As they returned, they saw an Indian on a high peak, spying over the surrounding country. This was early in the day. Dave Roberts and Alex Pickett took a bucket and pretended to be going for water. When they reached a ravine and disappeared out of the Indian's view, the two men slipped up the mountain, and at an opportune time each fired, and the Indian fell dead on the ground. A second Indian jumped up and the two also shot at him. It has been supposed that they also gave him a mortal wound, for the body of a second Indian was later found not far distant from this point. Five or six other Indians under the hill soon appeared on the scene and charged Dave Roberts and Alex Pickett. After considerable fighting, the two whites made an orderly retreat back to their ranch quarters. This episode occurred about 1858 in the Restley's Creek community, about four miles northeast of the present town of Lampkin in Comanche County. Before writing this section, the author interviewed George W. White of Hamilton, who lived in the Restley's Creek community about this time or shortly afterwards. So that's it for this episode. One other detail mentioned in the Indian depredations in Texas story was that little Peter Johnson was first brought into Cora. Cora was founded in 1854, where present-day Gustine, Texas is now. A log cabin residence became the first Comanche County Courthouse in 1856. Later, the courthouse was moved to Comanche after part of Comanche County became Hamilton County. This channel is called Unworthy History because we talk about actual history that is now deemed unworthy to discuss on history channels on TV. Those channels have abandoned their mission and don't show much actual history anymore. But here on this channel, we keep actual history alive by reading directly from old books. If you'd like to support the mission of Unworthy History, then consider joining our Patreon page or becoming a YouTube channel member. As a paid contributor, you will be recognized at the end of each episode, and you will also have access to members-only videos. So if you want to see more episodes like this, then be sure to like and subscribe. And we'll see you next time on Unworthy History.